Welcome to EM Cases Rapid Reviews, where we review the take-home points from the EM Cases main episode podcasts so you can ace your exams and take stellar care of your patients. Hey folks, it's Dr. Patrick Gilbride from Emergency Medicine Cases back with another rapid review. And in this episode, we're going to review episode 78 on anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. All right, so let's start this review by saying anaphylaxis is absolutely bread and butter emergency medicine. You know, you probably couldn't find a more eMERGE-related condition than anaphylaxis. And like Anton and Dr. Carr stated in the main podcast, while the majority of anaphylactic cases are pretty benign, about 1% of patients are going to die from their anaphylactic shock. And this happens in many cases for really one of two reasons. Either we're late to the party on making the correct diagnosis, or the patient receives inappropriate or inadequate treatment. Now don't get me wrong, anaphylaxis can be pretty sneaky. It's not like every patient is walking into your department and telling you, you know, that they just ate shellfish or they just took that first dose of the penicillin prescription you gave them 15 minutes ago. And in reality, up to 40% of patients have no identifiable trigger for their anaphylactic reaction. In the next few minutes, we're going to try to clarify that diagnostic criteria for anaphylaxis so you can quickly recognize both the classic and those not-so-classic presentations. We'll then review the management of anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock, and lastly, round things out by highlighting key considerations around patient discharge. Okay, first up, diagnosis. So anaphylaxis is highly likely when a patient experiences an acute onset of illness, so we're talking, you know, minutes to an hour, and it involves two or more of the following systems. Number one, involvement of the skin, mucosal tissues, or both. Number two, respiratory compromise. The third one would be the cardiovascular system, so, you know, reduced blood pressure or associated symptoms of end organ dysfunction. And then number four would be persistent gastrointestinal symptoms. And really, this definition highlights to you that you don't need to have a rash or mucosal involvement to have anaphylaxis. And in fact, upwards of 20% of people will have no rash symptoms whatsoever. But... Unfortunately, that's not all. If you want to take your diagnostic skills to the next level, you need to be aware that there's a subsection of patients whose anaphylactic reactions are going to present with really only just isolated hypotension. Therefore, in anyone with isolated hypotension and exposure to a suspected antigen, you know, i.e. That, that dose of IV medication you administered about 10 minutes ago, then you need to keep anaphylaxis on your differential and manage them accordingly. All right, well, that segues us well into our next section, the management of anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. Okay, so let's put this to bed up front. What's the first line treatment for anaphylaxis? Come on now, say it with me. Epinephrine, epinephrine, epinephrine. It is in no way diphenhydramine. Now I'm gonna say that again. It's not diphenhydramine. Now sure, you can give diphenhydramine as a second line agent to stop that patient's itch, but you know who also isn't itchy? It's that dead anaphylactic guy that you didn't give epinephrine to. So to start out, stick with the epinephrine. Now there's three key considerations to make when giving epinephrine to your anaphylactic patients. First off is timing. Now as soon as you have that diagnosis of anaphylaxis, you want to give that patient epinephrine immediately. And don't hesitate. Remember, there are no contraindications to epinephrine in severe anaphylaxis. The second key point is location. Don't be shy. Stick that epi in their thigh. An IM injection of epinephrine to the anterolateral thigh is absorbed seven times faster than an equivalent injection to the deltoid muscle. And now the last point is to make sure you give the patient the correct dose of epinephrine. An IM dose of epi and anaphylaxis is 0.01 milligrams per kilogram to a max of 0.5 milligrams. So really you only need to weigh 50 kilograms or, you know, 110 pounds in order to warrant that max dose. And remember, if you're using EpiPens, the patient is only receiving 0.3 milligrams with each administration. So you might actually be underdosing those patients. Okay, so let's say you've administered two appropriate doses of IM epinephrine spaced Q5 minutes and the patient is still persistently hypotensive or showing signs of anaphylactic shock. Well, you know, at this point it's time to move on to IV epinephrine. So you're going to want to inject one milligram of crash card epi into a one liter bag of normal saline. And that's going to give you an epi solution of about one micrograms per mil. You can now draw that solution up into a 10 cc syringe and administer push dose epi at about 5 to 10 mils or 5 to 10 micrograms every 2 to 5 minutes titrated to the effect for your patient. And while you're doing that and you're giving your push dose epi, you can ask nursing to hang that bag of epi solution and run it at 1 to 20 mils per minute titrated to effect. Now if your patient's still refractory and that's not enough, you may need to consider adding in a second agent with alpha activity. 
Now, vasopressin has been shown to be a good potential choice because it's effective in an acidic environment in a catecholamine depleted state. And if you elect to use vasopressin, you're going to want to start it off at 1 to 5 milligram IV bolus, followed by an infusion of 1 to 5 milligrams per hour. Okay, now on to the second line agents. The H1 and H2 blockers like diphenhydramine and ranitidine, they really have no evidence in the literature to suggest that they have any mortality benefit at all in anaphylaxis. Now that being said, there was a recent retrospective chart review published in Academic Emergency Medicine in 2017, which demonstrated that early administration of H1 treatment may actually decrease progression to anaphylaxis. Now the key thing to remember though is that in this talk we're talking about anaphylaxis. We're not trying to prevent anaphylaxis. And the treatment of anaphylaxis is to give epi, control that airway, etc. Now what about steroids? Our expert recommends only administering steroids if you've administered epi. No epi, no steroids. And steroids are going to take four to six hours to work, so they're not going to do anything to help you out with that acute phase of the anaphylactic reaction. A little clinical pearl from our expert would be to utilize dexamethasone as your steroid of choice in this situation because dex has got a long half-life of about 53 hours and therefore is going to negate the need to give any further doses or to give the patient a steroid prescription when they leave the emergency department at discharge. Now historically medical dogma had us believe that we needed to administer steroids to mitigate a biphasic anaphylactic reaction and that that was going to occur anywhere from you know one hour to seven days after the initial anaphylactic reaction. In observational data, it was reported this occurs in about 2-5% to of patients presenting with anaphylactic reactions. But is there really any benefit with steroids for biphasic reactions? Well, sorry guys, the jury's out on this one. Presently, there's no good evidence indicating a clear benefit, but until there's a large validated randomized control trial demonstrating definitively that steroids are not effective, then they should still likely remain standard of care in anaphylaxis. With regards to ops time, traditionally we've gone with four to six hours before discharge, but there's really no literature to support this timeline. Our expert recommends that patients should be observed until they are symptom free, regardless of time, before they're actually considered for discharge. And one important thing to take into consideration is that there's actually a subsect of patients that you may want to observe a little bit longer than your run-of-the-mill anaphylactic patients. These high-risk patients would include individuals on any antihypertensive medication, you know, particularly your beta blockers or your ACE inhibitors, individuals with early onset of symptoms after exposure to an allergen, asthmatics, and any individual who has a history of a severe reaction in the past. All right, well, that covers off management. Now let's talk about discharge instructions. One of the more common reasons for death in anaphylaxis is that our patients either just don't administer their EpiPens or they actually do so incorrectly. As eMERGE docs, we want to make sure that our patients know how to administer and when to administer this life-saving medication. Before they leave that ED, make sure you review the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and make sure they have a clear understanding of when to jab that EpiPen into their thigh. Further to that, you know, you want to make sure they actually know how to use that thing correctly. Your department should have a trainer EpiPen kicking around somewhere that you can take over to each anaphylactic patient to review administration. You know, teach them the rhyme, blue to the sky, orange to the thigh, show them how to remove that blue safety release mechanism, how to apply that orange end to the thigh, tell them, you know, wait 10 seconds so that the medication all gets delivered, and then at the end of that 10 seconds, call 911 and have them take you to the emergency department so that you can be managed more definitively. In addition to the standard script of two EpiPens, our experts recommend discharging the patient on a short course of a non-sedating antihistamine. They should receive an outpatient referral to an allergist and should be given instructions to obtain some type of medical alert pendant or, you know, bracelet. If your patient has already received a dose of steroids in the form of dexamethasone, then there's likely no need to provide any further script for steroids. However, if you opted for an alternative steroid, then you may want to consider giving them a short course. Well, that's our rapid review of anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock. The key take home points would be to recognize that the presentation of anaphylaxis can vary and by no means requires the presence of a rash. You know, in fact, exposure to an allergen and isolated hypotension alone is enough to meet criteria. Secondly, if you're managing an anaphylactic, immediately reach for that epi. It's the only medication to demonstrate any mortality benefit. And lastly, provide your patient with good discharge instructions, ensuring that they know when and how to use their EpiPens. Well, that's all for now. For references and a written summary on anaphylaxis and anaphylactic shock, go to the Emergency Medicine Cases Summary for Episode 78 at emergencymedicinecases.com.